Hello everyone, hope you guys are doing well out there. Welcome to this video on ultrasound of the neck and the nerves and vessels of the neck. Before you watch this video, if you have not watched this video, I highly recommend it, especially if you're new to ultrasound. This video is actually an adjunct to this older video, which discusses ocular ultrasound and assessment of the optic nerve, but because of COVID, we are not able to really do that. So, so instead of looking at the optic nerve in your labs, you guys will be looking at the brachial plexus as well as many of the cool structures in your neck. So objectives, first how to just get started with ultrasound, including patient positioning as well as some basics with the machine. And then we'll cover two approaches. The lateral approach will, will be able to visualize the brachial plexus as well as many of the cervical roots. And we'll also have a medial approach where you can actually visualize the thyroid gland, the carotid, internal jugular vein, as well as the vagus nerve and your cervical sympathetic trunk. So this is a, about the brachial plexus and, and uh, really the first thing to do is just to position your patient. Uh, we usually like to have patients in, in gurneys or beds, but this is, this is fine too. Just, they're just kind of laying down, they're recumbent about 45 degrees or so. And we want the neck to be extended so we'll have uh, our, our, our patient here, um, Dr. Weingrove. <laughs> um, kind of extend his neck and kind of look the opposite way or contralaterally. And what we're uh, going to do is we're going to use this high frequency linear probe. Um, this gives you the best resolution, usually uh, really great for procedures as well as for very superficial structures like the neck and uh, arteries and uh, veins as well as nerves. And here is the indicator dot on the probe, we generally want to be able to have this dot correspond to the same dot on the screen so that when I'm looking at my patient that this dot will face this way so that there's no, um, there's no confusion in terms of the orientation. So the screen is like this. Now if I'm on the opposite side, I'm still going to have that dot point to this way because I still want to be able to have the same orientation uh, where if I'm on the right side, it means the right side of the screen. Okay. All right, thank you, Alan. It's a little, I guess, meta to see myself talking and also narrating this video. All right, let's move on. Um, so the lateral approach, um, basically, you're going just above or superior to the clavicle and you are uh, putting the probe in a transverse or axial plane. And um, one thing to notice is that you have the subclavian artery and just lateral to that, you will see the actual brachial plexus. So for the lateral approach, first just start by palping the, the clavicle and put your probe kind of in the middle third of the clavicle, just above it. And what you'll see is a pulsatile structure right here. This is the subclavian artery. And you'll also see, just lateral to that, um, the bone of the clavicle with shadowing. And you'll also see um, this line right here that kind of seems to go back and forth, and that's the pleura of the right apex of the lung. And the brachial plexus is just lateral and a little bit more anterior to this subclavian artery. And it's seen as um, these hypochoic bundles that are, are coalesced together. Now from this approach, what you'll need to do is just kind of slide the probe a little bit laterally and a little bit more superiorly. And what you'll start to notice is that there will be two muscle bellies um, along with the SCM on top. You have your anterior scalene and your middle scalene muscles in short axis. And in between that, you have um, a set of cervical nerves coming out, C5, C6, C7, and C8. And in terms of uh, kind of like just a, a schematic, this is the anterior scalene, 
this is the middle scalene, and in between you have your um, your nerve roots coming out right here. So these are three slightly different views of a cervical bone. Uh, this is an axial view where you're kind of looking at from top to bottom. And this is a sagittal view where you're kind of looking at this from left, from the left side of the, of the patient. And this is a, a different sagittal view where you're looking at from the right side. And these blue arrows point towards the anterior or the front of the patient. So we know that the cervical roots come from the spinal cord right here, and they exit out here um, along this transverse process in between the, the anterior tubercle and the posterior tubercle of each of the transverse processes. And how we identify the different levels of the cervical roots is by the appearance of the actual tubercles for example, C7, there is a posterior tubercle, but there's really no anterior tubercle, and that's how we can identify that this is a C7 root. Whereas for C6, we have a very prominent anterior tubercle, and that's how we identify that C6. And for C5, the anterior and posterior tubercles are about the same height. And just for a little bit more clarification, our ultrasound probe is situated like right here in a, kind of like a posterior lateral positioning and it's pointed more anterior and medial um, so that we are looking at the cervical root as well as some of the vessels and structures up here in the anterior medial portion of the neck. So from the interscalene approach to find C7 it's just really a, a slight little tilting or sliding of the probe a little bit more superiorly and what you'll find is when you keep on going this is that that middle scalene middle scalene anterior scalene right here and as you slide more you start to see that posterior tubercle right here without any anterior tubercle and that makes this c7 right here to find c6 from the level c7 all you need to do is to slide or tilt the probe a little bit more superiorly and you'll find a very prominent anterior tubercle right here as well as uh, the posterior tubercle and so this is how you know that this is a C6 root. And just a, a little bit of historical uh, fact, this anterior tubercle is easily palpated in most people and is actually the basis of the anatomical approach for uh, what's called a cervical sympathetic trunk nerve block. So this anterior tubercle that is palpable was first discovered by a French physician named Chazanac, Dr. Chazanac, I guess. And with this technique, you would actually palpate this anterior tubercle and using a needle actually um, insert it perpendicularly until you hit the tubercle here and um, then start to inject your local anesthetic. Now from C6, again, you just wanna slide or tilt the probe a little bit more superiorly, and then you'll find, um, again, the anterior and posterior tubercles here, anterior, here's posterior, and here's that nerve root coming out. So we know that this is C5. Okay, now for the medial approach. We'll have the patient looking up with the neck extended, and what we'll do is we'll palpate the laryngeal prominence of the thyroid cartilage, and as you slide more inferiorly, you'll hit the cricoid cartilage, and as you keep on going, you'll actually feel like the tracheal rings of the trachea. Now going back up to the cricoid cartilage and the thyroid cartilage, there will be a little bit of a depression, and that will be the cricothyroid membrane. And this corresponds to level of C6, and this is where you want to place your probe in a transverse or axial plane. And when you do that, and you, as you slide a little bit more laterally, you'll see a gaggle or a you know, collection, just a bunch of different important structures, including the trachea from the right, the thyroid gland, this is the right thyroid lobe. Uh, you also see the, um, the two bellies of the SCM muscle. Then you also see the carotid uh, specifically the common carotid artery 
and then you'll see the internal juggler vein right here, which is slightly compressed because the patient is essentially sitting up. Now, in the same window, if you just look deep to the carotid, you actually have the longus coli in a short axis. And just above that, you have the cervical sympathetic trunk, which is just deep to this prevertebral fascia right here. Now, if you look at the carotid, the common carotid right here, and you just look lateral in, in between the internal juggler and the carotid, you actually have this collection of hypochoic uh, bundles here. And this is actually the vagus nerve. So a lot of really cool structures in a small amount of space. You can use color Doppler whenever you are visualizing an anechoic or hypochoic structure. Um, and that will just help you to tell if there is flow within that structure. Uh, this is flow within the common carotid artery and the internal jugular vein right here. Oh, there's an earthquake. Just remember that flow going towards the probe or the top of the screen will be red and flow going away from the probe uh, or towards the bottom of the screen will be blue. Now with this carotid, you actually have blue and red flow and it just means that um, basically the flow is actually going in and out of the screen and not necessarily up or away from, from the probe. So in addition to helping you learn the anatomy, ultrasound helps to guide many critical procedures in medicine. Um, just a couple of quick examples. So for the brachial plexus, sometimes for upper extremity surgeries, uh, especially when the patient is unable to tolerate general anesthesia or you just don't have a ventilator uh, available, you can do a brachial plexus nerve block uh, for many of these surgeries. Uh, as well as for um, post-op care and, and pain control. And in the ED setting or emergency department setting, we usually have a lot of shoulder dislocations and upper extremity fractures that can also be successfully reduced uh, with these nerve blocks. Now for that cervical sympathetic chain or trunk, um, it's used w for a wide variety of applications. One is uh, when you have a complex regional pain syndrome, um, that is typically mediated by that um, cervical trunk. Uh, a block of that can, can really improve the pain. And in kind of more life-threatening situations when you have, actually have a patient with something like a refractory ventricular tachycardia um, or a ventricular fibrillation, a uh, cervical stellate ganglion block um, is often very successful in terminating these um, really uh, malignant tachycardias. So that's it. Thank you for your attention. Uh, remember that ultrasound is a valuable skill and like any skill you need to practice and practice and practice to get better to the point where you're confident. Thank you to Dan Weingro, Kareem Agunbiari, and Julia Guo for helping out with this video. And again, if you need to reach me, this is my email address.